Lord, holy is your name. Lord, you are so gracious and so merciful, so kind to us, so righteous, so perfect, so full of peace. Lord, you're the author of life and you're the sustainer of it. Lord, holy, holy are you. Holy, holy are you. Holy is your name alone, Lord. Lord, we do thank you this morning for your mercy and grace. We thank you for your kindness. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings in our lives that we just don't deserve. Lord, all of us are fallen, all of us are broken, all of us are messed up, and we're all in the same place, Lord, but we're at the foot of your cross, Lord, where we find grace and peace and mercy from you. And we thank you for that this morning. Lord, thank you for this country we live in. Thank you for those who serve her. Lord, protect them, watch over them. Watch over her leaders. Lord, watch over the, those who serve in your church. Lord, those who, who lead your church and lead your people, who shepherd your flock all over the world, Lord. Protect them, Lord. Protect those who, who are being persecuted for your namesake. Lord, give them even more boldness to speak out ever more boldly for your truth, Lord. And Father, this morning as we, as we just learn more about you, as, as we want to just know more about you, not just so that we can have information, but so that we can fall more and more deeply in love with you, Lord, so we can know who you are, so we can have a, an intimate, deep, close, personal relationship with you. Father, help us, to, help us to grasp who you are. Help us to understand how wonderful you are, how holy, holy, holy you are. Oh, Lord, you're so good. You're so good. I wish your praises could just continue here forever, Lord. I just wish we could just, just keep on singing and singing, Lord. Thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your mercy and grace and your peace. Lord, you are good to us. You are so good to us. Lord, we can repeat that all day and it wouldn't be enough, Lord. It wouldn't do it justice. You're so good. You're so good. You're so good. You're so good. We love you, Lord. Give us this time now to learn more about you and help us to just fall more in love with you. In Jesus' name, amen. God is so good, amen. <laughs> He's awesome. You know, we're learning about uh, the attributes of God, his, uh, his uh, communicable attributes. Those are the attributes that we share with him. And, and as we're going through this study, we're talking about what is God like and we're talking about uh, 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 his personality and, and, and what it is to get to know him. And we've talked about so far uh, uh, his goodness uh, in, under his attributes of morality. We've talked about his goodness. And we've also talked about, last week, we talked about his love, how loving he is, how, uh, how just limitless his love is. Uh, and this morning, we want to just continue talking about his, his attributes of morality and so this morning, we want to begin by talking about his patience, God's patience. And we understand that that's a quality of his goodness, but here's how we define God's patience. We define God's patience as God's goodness in withholding immediate punishment. Because all of us deserve immediate punishment. I mean, once you, once you violate God's law, there's, the, there's a sense in which you, you immediately uh, uh, deserve this punishment. But yet, because of his patience, because of his, his scripture also calls it his long suffering. Because of that, he withholds and he waits. And the Old Testament frequently refers to his patience as either his low, long suffering or as him being slow to anger. And we won't turn to all the passages in the Old Testament, but there's so many. There's Exodus 34, 6, Numbers 4, 18, Psalm 86, 15, Psalm 103, 8, Psalm 145, 8, Jonah 4, 2, Nahum 1, 3. It's all over the place, and we can go on. But the Old Testament speaks of God being slow to anger and patient. Now, the New Testament speaks of God's kindness and his forbearance and his patience. Here's three passages for you to consider. Romans 2, 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and the forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? 
That's why he waits. That's why he's patient. It, it's, not because he's, it's not because he's slow to, to, to finish things out or to keep his promises, but because he wants us to repent, to come to him so that everybody that's going to come is going to come. And then 1 Timothy 1.16, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me, this is Paul talking, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience. See, Paul thought he was the foremost sinner. He called himself the chiefest of sinners. He thought he was the most screwed up guy in the, in the world that ever lived. And he says, if God can show me this kind of grace and patience, imagine what an example that is to you. So he says, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those uh, who were to believe in him for eternal life. And then, of course, Romans 9.22 says, what if God, desiring to show his, his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? So he's, even those who deserve destruction, he's being patient with them. He's waiting. It's tremendous, God's patience. And by the way, we talk about this being a communicable attribute. That means it's something we share with him. And so we're supposed to, according to James 1, uh, 19 through 20, listen to this. It says, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. This is, this is like the best marriage advice in the world right here. This is it. Be, be, be slow, uh, slow to speak, slow to anger, uh, quick to hear. Uh, for the anger of man does not achieve uh, the righteousness of God. And so we have to do that in our human relationships. We also have to be patient, folks, when we suffer. When you are enduring a, a affliction and persecution and all kinds of hardship in life, 1 Peter 2.20, uh, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure but if when you do good, see, that's the thing, when we do good and we still suffer for it or we're persecuted for it, if you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. See, when we show patience and long suffering uh, uh, under affliction and under persecution, that's what he wants. When the chips are down and life is hard and things are tough, this is when he wants us to show patience. And it's a wonderful thing when we can do so because we're imitating God. Next Patience should characterize every facet of our lives, really, as Christians. Ephesians 4, 2 through 3, with all humility and gentleness and patience. Do you get those three? Think of those. Humility. Picture that in your mind. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This is specifically talking about Christians, how we should treat one another. Do you notice it says bearing one another? Have you ever wondered why it says to Christians that we have to bear with one another? Isn't that funny? Because y'all are easy to get along with. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. We bear with one another, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And when we do this, folks, we're acting like God, and it's wonderful. He wants us to act this way. Next, it is listed among, of course, the fruit of the Spirit. This whole patience thing is listed among the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There's no law. So if the Spirit is living within us and if the Spirit is actually working in us and changing the way we think and act, then we should be a people of patience. Now, Aside from the Holy Spirit living inside of us that empowers to, us to do that, what else is it that could, that could give us this, this uh, desire to be patient or, or enable us to be patient? Well, Scripture tells us, James chapter 5, 8, you also, you also be patient, establish your hearts, here's, here's the catch at the end right here, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Why should you be patient? See, when we're wronged, here's what we want to do. Some of us have a profound sense of justice. I don't know if you're like that, but I want wrongs to be righted right now, right? I'm like the avenger. You know, I want to go out there and make all the wrongs right. But listen to this. Listen to this. It says, you also be patient. Establish your hearts. Why? Because the coming of the Lord is at hand. In other words, he's going to come and he's going to right all the wrongs. Every injustice that's out there that's ever happened that you're impatient about, that you want to take into your own hands. He says, listen, 
I'm coming. I'm going to take care of this. And so knowing that the Lord is coming enables our patience. Our imitation of God's love requires us to be patient. Next, not only is God a God of, of patience, but he is also a God of mercy. A God of mercy. How do we define mercy? Well, we define it like this. God's goodness towards those in distress. God's goodness towards those in distress. That's what mercy is. You know, I have a hard time because I know that all of God's attributes are equal. And I know that, that we can't necessarily single out any one of them because they're so uh, inter intertwined with one another. But can I confess to you that of all God's attributes, this is for some reason the one my brain goes to, is, is his mercy. His mercy, his mercy. Uh, there's, there's this song by Casting Crowns that says, uh, your mercy saved me, your mercy made me whole. It's just, ah, it's overwhelming when I think about it. It's God's, God's uh, goodness towards those who are in distress. And of course, David talks about this. 2 Samuel 24, 14, David says, Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Isn't that interesting passage? Let me not fall into the hand of man, but I'll fall into the hand of God any time. And then, of course, Paul speaks of God's comfort in the midst of affliction on the basis of his mercy. 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Wonderful. See, in time of need, you and I can draw near to God for mercy and grace. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 tells us, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Drawing near to the throne of grace means we can pray any time. We can come boldly and say, Lord, I need mercy. Give me mercy. We can cry out to him for mercy. And it's a wonderful thing. And then 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of mercies. That's his, that's his name. That's his title. The Father of mercies. And the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. See, we take God's comfort and we just pass it right along with the same comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. It's a wonderful thing. And that leads us into why it's communicable because we take the comfort that God gives us and we just pass it right on. It's like we're a conduit. We just, boom, we pass it right on. And Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, of course, in the Beatitudes, Jesus is speaking here and he says, blessed are the merciful for they shall what? Receive what? Yeah, you guys are good. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So if blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, then blessed are those who receive mercy, because we should be merciful. That's how that works. So not only is, a God, is God a God of patience, and not only is God a, a God of mercy, but God is also a God of grace. How do we define grace? Grace is God's goodness towards those who, who deserve only punishment. It's God's goodness towards those who, who deserve only punishment. There's a song by the Newsboys, if you've ever heard the Newsboys. You know, I love this band. And they talk about, uh, they talk about the difference between mercy and grace. And they talk about, uh, 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 let's see, how do the lyrics go? Remind me, somebody, when, when you don't get what you deserve, it's a real good thing, right? When you get what you don't deserve, it's a real good thing. See that? That's how that works. Mercy and grace. You know, I've had people tell me, oh, I, di I didn't get what I deserve. That's a good thing. In most cases, that's a good thing. So God's grace God's grace. This is God's favor towards those who deserve no favor at all. And by the way, let me tell you this. God's grace is never obligatory. He never has to. He never has to show grace. And, but yet he does. 
He is never obligated to, but he always freely gives grace. Exodus chapter 33 verse 19 is actually quoted in Romans chapter 9 verse 15. Where he says this, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Yet God is also consistently gracious. He's consistently gracious. In fact, he's called the God of grace. First Peter chapter 5 verse 10 says, and after you have suffered a little while, the what? The God of grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So, I want you to catch this when we're talking about grace. It is salvation itself that comes by grace and by grace alone. It does not come by any human effort. None at all, none whatsoever. And this is a tremendous and very important thing for us all to grasp. I want us to catch this. Salvation itself comes by grace. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 tells us. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who? Who's all? That's me. That's you. That's your grandma. That's everyone. All have fallen, uh, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a what? As a gift. You know what a gift is? Gift is something you don't deserve. Nobody owes it to you. As a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Romans eleven six. 6. But if it is by grace, if it is by grace, then it is no longer on the basis of works. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say a little bit of works. You know, if I'm a little bit good and I kind of do right and I go to church once in a while and I don't mess up too bad, then that maybe combined with some of God's goodness might weasel me into heaven. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. Amen. You're completely, just like me, you're completely corrupt, completely unredeemable, except for by the blood of Christ through his grace and mercy alone. And this is why it says, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Folks, you couldn't work hard enough, long enough, good enough to earn one ounce of forgiveness can't do it otherwise grace would no longer be grace that's how it works we rely on him completely and Paul also makes it clear that since grace is unmerited then there is no one human attitude that is more important as an instrument of receiving this grace than faith there is no one human attitude that is appropriate as an instrument of receiving grace than faith. And I'll show you what I mean. Romans chapter uh, 4, verse 16. See, we, there's often a confusion, in, even amongst Christians. What's the difference and, and what's, the, what's the interrelationship between grace and faith? Like, are we saved by grace or are we saved by faith? Or how does that work, right? Watch this. That is why it depends on faith. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace. You got both words there. That's why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace. And be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares in the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Abraham was the father of faith. Scripture says, by faith it was reckoned to him as righteousness, you see. His faith, his faith and our faith, my faith, your faith, is the one human attitude appropriate as an instrument for receiving grace. Amen. Why? Why is this so? Because faith is the one human attitude that is exactly the direct opposite. It is the antitype of depending on yourself. It's the opposite. If you're, by your faith, you're depending on God to do something, then you are not depending on yourself to do it. You're depending on God because it relies entirely upon God's grace. That is faith. You say faith. Well, faith in what? Faith in what? See, we have to answer that question. If it is necessary for us to have faith, then it's faith in what? It's faith in the fact that we can only be saved by God's grace. That's what we have faith in. 
faith in his grace that caused him to sacrifice himself and shed his blood as a propitiation for our sins. Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that's what we have faith in. And it's devoid, here's the good news. It's devoid of all attempts to gain righteousness by human effort. You don't have to try harder. You don't have to do better. You don't have to clean up your act. Once we're in Christ, as a natural result of being in Christ, we will want to naturally follow him. But it is not the means of salvation, folks. You come to him ugly. You come to him dirty. You come to him wallowing, just like I came to him. We're all in the same boat. Not one of us is clean unless we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And if God's favor is to come to us apart from our own merit, then it must come when we depend not on our own merit, but on the merits of another, and that's Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And that's when we have faith. And that's why it's necessary to have faith. So, salvation itself comes by faith. And next and lastly, not only does salvation come by grace, but the entire life of a Christian is a result of God's continual grace. Let me show you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Boy, let me tell you. This passage is so near and dear to me. It is but by the grace of God that I am what I am, that I can do anything, that he can use me in any way. It's by the grace of God, and his grace toward me was not in vain. It wasn't for nothing. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, uh, Paul says, though it was not I but the grace of God that was within me. Here's what Paul's saying. The grace of God, when I grasped, when I understood the ugliness of my own sin and how much the grace of God overcame all that and saved me, it motivated me to live a life of gratitude toward him, which completely radically changed the way I thought and the way I behaved. And that is how we grow closer to Christ, folks. It's because we look at his grace. Not because we try harder or white knuckle it or buckle down or, or try to get all of our ducks in a row. It's because of his grace. Look, I was saved by grace and I stand in grace. Both. Both. Continually. By grace we've been saved and by grace we continue to stand by his mercy. See, you can call upon his grace at any time. And in fact, if you don't know Jesus Christ, or if you are not sure 100% that you are saved, you right here, right now, you don't have to come up to an altar. You can sit right there in your seats, right where you are. Close your eyes. And you can call upon his grace. You can come boldly before the throne, Scripture says, and ask for his mercy, ask for his grace. Have you ever come to a point in your life where you've just felt like you're tired. Have you ever come to a point in your life where with all your best efforts and everything that you could muster, it seems like you just keep fumbling the ball. It's not like you messed up once. It's like you just keep doing it. It's like you're incurable. And you get to this point where you're just like, man, there, there's just nothing else I can ask for but your mercy. There's nothing else that I can want but your grace. I need your grace. I need it to just, just, just pour down on me, to be lavished on me like, like rain. His grace like rain in your life.
just like that. When you get to the point in your life, you say, hallelujah, grace like rain falling down on me. That's all we need. And it's what he offers. Father, we thank you this morning for your grace. We thank you for your patience. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. Father, right now, I thank you for your love. Lord, your love that is limitless. Your patience and mercy and grace that have no end. Lord, it's just awesome to think about how wonderful you are. And no matter who we are or where we've been or what we've done, we can always run to you, Lord. We can always come before your throne of grace and ask for mercy. Mercy on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Thank you for being so good. Lord, your love, your love never fails, Lord. Lord, even when we're running from you, Lord, you never give up on us. Your love never stops pursuing us. Your love never gives up chasing us. Your love never runs out, no matter how far we run away. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name.